Hello and welcome, this is Mouse Gunner, and we're back with some more Automation, the Car Company Tycoon game, continuing on with the campaign roleplay of the Edison Car Company in 1996. And because the model building in the game is much more complex than it has been in the past, I'm going to change things up a bit, and I went ahead and I made uh, the model we're going to be looking at in this video, as well as a couple other models that we'll be looking at in the future, ahead of time, so that we can just go through the different setup that I have and the results that I got with that setup. So if we take a look at the Edison Star, which is the mid-size family sedan and the Edison Car Company's lineup, with the base model, which has a... 2 liter 4 cylinder engine with a manual transmission and we start from the beginning with the chassis set up and we're gonna get this message but we're not gonna be changing anything anyway we have a monocoque chassis with corrosion resistant steel for the material this is a front transverse mount which you can actually see the engine mounted there this has a McPherson strut in the front and torsion beam in the rear and corrosion resistant steel is what the panel material is made out of. Very similar to the way the Luna was set up. Mostly this is just a larger vehicle with a more powerful engine. Moving on to the setup. I already mentioned this is a transverse front wheel drive. And let's just take a look at the engine so we get a reminder of its power if you haven't seen that video. So it's producing 111 horsepower and 112 foot-pounds of torque. Hopping into the trim setup here, starting off with the gearbox. This is a five-speed manual, and the fifth gear is set up to be an economy gear. So the gear goes a bit beyond the estimated top speed to get good fuel economy. And the end result of that is a 0 to 62 time of 10.7 seconds with a little bit of wheel spin and a fuel economy of 26.5 miles per gallon. The tire setup is here. I went with 195 millimeter width, both in front and rear. That's nice for tire rotation ability. And went with medium compo compound road and steel rim material. For the brakes, I went with solid disc, two piston, rather than the single piston that was in the Luna. And made those brakes more or less as big as they could be. And we have drum in the rear, keeping that cost low. We have a little bit of brake fade, but overall not too bad. Cooling airflow, I went with a fully clad under tray. And as I normally do, I went with about 10 over the required cooling for this engine. We have five seats, standard interior, standard cassette, power steering with ABS system, and standard safety. The suspension, we have standard gas monotube and passive sway bars. And this is more or less my suspension setup. And the end result that we have is drivability of 44, sportiness of 21.4, comfort of 22.6, Prestige of 15.4 and safety of 40.9. And if I go to the test track, we can go ahead and get a run. So with its current setup, we're getting 1 minute 40.84. And also we can see some of the setup of the overall car. So the weight distribution, this is a lot more front heavy than the Luna was. Uh, so we do have some issues caused by that, but that does, with a front-wheel drive car, it does give us more traction with those front wheels because most of the weight is up there. Alright, let's go ahead and jump into the next trim, which is going to be an automatic version of the standard trim. And the main difference we're going to have with this is it being an automatic gearbox rather than a manual. And this is a four-speed automatic, and the gearbox is set up quite a bit differently. There is no economy gear. The fourth gear goes pretty much right up to that estimated top speed. This makes the gearbox a little bit more aggressive, but we drop off in fuel economy 
And this is to combat the massive penalty you get from switching from a manual transmission to an automatic transmission in year zero to 62 times that exists in the game currently. So we see even with that shift and making the setup a little bit more aggressive, we are still experiencing a pretty big drop off uh, in zero to 62 time of 11.8 seconds. We have a bit more wheel spin because I did go more aggressive with that uh, gearbox setup. Otherwise, we have more or less the same setup with the tires and wheels set up. Brakes are going to be the same, as is the aerodynamics. The interior is also the same, as is the suspension. But we do get a difference in the overall stats, as you can see here. Let's go ahead and jump into the test track and get our time. And as we can see, we lost not quite three seconds, but pretty close to it. About two and a half seconds, give or take, is what we lost in time there. And a lot of that is down to just the big difference in the 0 to 62 time, as well as a top speed drop off as well. All right, let's jump into the V6 variants. So both of these are going to have automatic transmission. So once you uh, select the option for the, the V6, you no longer have the option of choosing a manual. Only the base trim is going to have that manual transmission. So we'll start with the standard, which is mostly going to be an engine change. So let's look at the engine. So this is a V6 that produces 168 horsepower and 168 foot-pounds of torque. So big boost in performance there. And the gearbox setup is going to be more or less the same kind of idea as our previous automatic, but we allowed for the uh, fourth gear to go a little bit more beyond the estimated top speed than before. But the end result is we get a 0 to 62 time of 9.5 seconds. So we're a little bit quicker here. We are losing uh, fuel economy, and there is more wheel spin as well because we have more power to contend with. The tire setup is going to be pretty much the same as is the brakes. The aerodynamics is going to change because we require more uh, uh, airflow for the cooling, so that has changed. But as uh, I do normally, just as we did before, it's about 10 above the required cooling. Now, the interior setup is exactly the same. This is still the standard trim setup. So none of that has changed. And there's going to be some differences with the suspension setup, I believe. Uh, because of the difference uh, of the engine, there's going to be difference in weight as well. So I did balance things a little bit differently, but it shouldn't be too much of a departure. So let's go ahead and jump into the test track here. And we can see the top speed has gone up. And we also see it's much more front heavy as well. Uh, because of an increase in weight. And a lot of that increase of weight is the engine, which is up front. So let's get our time. And the time that we're getting now is 1 minute, 37 seconds, 0.85. So we're able to drop off, I think, close to 3 seconds from the previous time of the 2-liter uh, manual transmission, which was our previous best, I believe. I think it was 140.8 something, somewhere around there. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the last trim, which is the premium trim with the V6. So this still has an automatic transmission, which is the only option with this V6. So this automatic transmission is going to be set up pretty much the same as is the tire setup going to be the same as is the brake setup and the aerodynamics is not going to be changed at all. The interior is going to be the main change so we upgraded to a premium interior with a premium CD selection as well as adding on traction control to that premium trim. Now suspension shouldn't be too much different from the other V6 version probably exactly the same and let's take a look at the test track now I did try and balance things out with the gearbox setup I believe because it was uh, I tried to get it closer to the the 0 to 62 time of the previous engine I actually don't know if I did that 100% or not let's just take a quick look at that jumping into the standard trim 
So yeah, there is a big difference, and maybe I didn't set up the gearbox all that differently. I, it looks like I did a little bit, but I uh, only probably mitigated the difference in that weight a tad bit. So if we look at the gearbox again. We can see I went more aggressive with it. So uh, I reduced the top speed, and I did reduce the spacing a little bit, but we're still uh, having a slower 0-62 to 62 time. I, I try and get uh, the uh, difference between the standard and premium. I try to get those as close as possible, but there is a pretty significant difference in weight, so it is sometimes hard to achieve. But uh, let's go back to the test track, as I believe I did show all the other tabs. So because of that premium trim being added in we have more weight and that is distributing that weight a little bit more evenly now uh, or bringing some of it back to the rear so it's not quite as front heavy but we definitely have an increase in weight so let's go ahead and take a look at the track time and see the result of all that weight and a slower zero to 62 time so the end result is we gain about a half a second uh, of overall time around the track. So not a big difference, but it is definitely a difference. All right, now that we've looked at all the trims, let's go ahead and look at the development process. So this is the project setup. We've already set up our team. I set it up exactly how I did with the Luna, just using the uh, highest level uh, team members for the lead, and then the engineering team is set up of specialists in each of the different uh, fields. And I went with more or less the same kind of focus I went with the Luna. So I went with more of an efficient uh, focus. We're trying to get numbers out there. We're trying to get the, uh, the costs lower and the time down. We're not so keen on advancing our understanding of tech and, and that with this model. The same is true with the engine setup. So not too much of a divergence from what we did with the Luna. Now, the factory setup, again, I'm going to try and stick with large factories, although I might uh, divert from that when we get to the asteroid, and we'll have to see when we get there. But with my factory setup of a large factory, I'm currently producing 981 cars total. But of that 981 cars being produced, I am diverting that to the different trims. So the automation setup is that I have uh, 75 for automation, Cooling quality is at the baseline of 50, and shifts is at 3. Now, one thing I notice when you change the shift number is it does have a, a, a effect on the quality. So this is your more or less your quality graph. Now, I don't know what the green, yellow, and red bars mean. There's no key here, so I don't know what they mean. But we can guess that this is car quality, and these different bars are different aspects of that car's quality. And our car's production uh, is going to fall somewhere in between this uh, bell graph pretty much so one thing that I notice as we increase the shifts we're decreasing our quality so as we see if we reduce it down to one shift we're not producing anywhere near the number of cars and we're taking a lot more time and a lot more money to produce those cars but that bell graph is not nearly as uh, affected by increasing the shift number as you can see the we're starting to shift down to lower quality production and we're widening out some of these lines so that there's much more of a variance in that quality as well so that is kind of a downside but we're trying to get out as many cars as we can we're trying to get that uh, production up so and the cost down so we are using a lot of manpower here now for the engines I also have a large factory and the uh, total engines made at this factory is 629 but there are two engines being produced and they divide these out so this first uh, factory is only producing the two liter engines so i tried to pair that to the production of the cars that we're making so if we total up the two liter engine uh cars we get around about uh 600 ish production so i paired that with round about 630 of the two liter engine so we're getting close to the same 
production levels that were producing the cars that take those engines. It's not something I really did with the Luna and probably should have done, but from here on out, I'm trying to match that production. So as far as the way I set up that production, I still have the 75% automation, but I am not using nearly as many shifts to produce the engines because I want to keep, keep the, the numbers low. We don't need nearly as much production. We're not trying to build these as fast as we can because we can, in this larger factory, produce them pretty easily at the numbers that we need. So we have the same kind of setup with the V6 engines. I'm only producing 367 engines because that's all we need for the V6s. And as a result, I only need 1.2 shifts to do that. So if we come back to the car models, just so you can overview uh, how I uh, divvied up the different uh, car production. So the uh, car model that is probably at its lowest is the, the base uh, two liter engine uh, with the manual transmission. Uh, I figure with this being the U.S. market, not as many cars are being sold with manual transmissions in uh, these days of 1996 and honestly the modern day as well. So not as much of that is slotted, even though this would probably be the most affordable car that we produce. Not a much, as much production is slotted for that. Now I figure the most uh, desirable car will be our automatic version, though, of that standard trim. So I have that in the largest production. Then I follow that with the standard V6. And then uh, the lowest production or close to the production of the manual uh, is the premium V6. Now, I could move this around uh, depending on what I think the markets would uh, do. And I wonder if the game, when, if we get to that uh, campaign mode, if you would get some kind of projection when you're designing uh, a car model of what your market uh, would be for each of these trims so that I would be able to match the production with it. Now, this would be a prediction and not precise, uh, and you might be wrong with that prediction depending on maybe the skill of your staff. Uh, you would be off with this number, your your desired number, but or your predicted number. Uh, but that would be a nice feature to see once the campaign game is implemented. But now that we've seen how I have uh, divvied up the production, let's look at how I did in the market with these different trims. And we'll start with the uh, base uh, model, the two liter version with the manual transmission. The more or less, I'm hitting a lot of the same markets that I did with the Luna. So uh, the three that we're big in is family sport, fun, and uh, pony. Now I think we're hitting the more sporty elements because of that manual transmission, but we're also hitting the segments that I really would like to hit, which is the family segment, the standard family segment, and the commuter segment. These are the two segments that I am um, uh, most trying to get uh, buyers from. So it's good that we did well in there. We also did family premium a little bit, as well as uh, city premium. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the next trim, which is the uh, automatic version. And we're going to see a little bit of variance in the markets we hit. So we're not hitting the fun market as much. We're still hitting the pony market, but instead we're hitting the family sport, family premium. And we're still doing well in the family and commuter uh, segments, as well as family utility, which I think we were doing before. And I believe we're scoring well better in these two segments, uh, but not quite as well on the family sport and the pony segments, I believe. And now that's just my uh, rough memory uh, from before, but you guys can do a more direct comparison and jump to the, the around in the video if you want that comparison more easily than I can do. Let's go ahead and jump into the V6 version now. And this is the standard trim that we're looking at. So again, we are hitting the uh, family sport and the uh, pony segments, but we're now hitting the uh, the family premium here as well, which I think we were before. But uh, I think we're scoring a little bit higher in these segments now, and when I say a little bit, pretty significantly in the pony segment, as well as I think in the family sport segment. Uh, I don't think we did much of an improvement in the family and commuter segment as we did before, but uh, we're still scoring pretty well in those segments. And finally, we have our last trim, which now we're hitting the more premium segments here. So we're really hitting that family premium and the city premium 
significantly. We dropped off in the pony, but we've remained strong in the family sport, and we've kind of moved over to the commuter pr premium as well. So we're not scoring nearly as well as we were in the past with the family and commuter segments, but we're still doing pretty darn good. Now, I did go with a flat 5% markup with all of these models, and I hope you were paying attention to the price because it's not really something that I highlighted, but with our most expensive uh, trim, we're having a car that is costing about seven, sixteen and a half thousand for the customer. All right, with all that looked at, let's go ahead and uh, look at a comparison of our two models that we've featured so far. I know I have built a couple other models uh, here, and I was working on another one as well, but uh, those are not yet featured in videos, so we'll only focus on what's featured in video. So our comparison here is between the Luna and the Star, and we can see that we're getting benefits here uh, in drivability for the most part. The only one, yeah, pretty much across the board, we have bonuses in drivability. Uh, if you compare like to like, so our, our manual to our manual, we see that there's an improvement. Our automatic to our automatic, there's improvements there as well. So that's nice to see. We also have improvements in sportiness, and that is, I would say, in a large part due to more powerful engines. Uh, our comfort is, looks like it is more or less the same. So here to here, it's 23. It looks like we dropped off a little bit with our 2-liter automatic to our automatic up here but our our uh, v6 uh matches that uh pretty well and then our premium trim obviously is more comfortable uh prestige we more or less are, are improved over the luna and again i think that's due to higher performance engines and safety is also an improvement due to higher weight we are losing out in practicality not quite as good as it was with the luna uh, Off-road is about the same, although there is a little bit of a dip with the automatic version of the Luna. And utility, I would say, is uh, more or less the same. If you compare it to like to like, we've got 19 versus 19, 23 versus 23. We get a little bit more with the V6 uh, variants, but uh, that's not really a, a very like to like comparison, in my opinion. Now, reliability... Uh, it looks like the Luna is the more reliable of the bunch, again, comparing like to like. So you have 70 versus 72 and 67 versus 69. And then our V6 variants are a little bit less reliable, although actually 67 versus 68, I guess our, our standard V6 is a little bit better. Uh, going, and I think that might be due to the aluminum engine. This is cast engine. This is aluminum, I believe. Uh, fuel efficiency goes more or less how you'd expect, not quite as good as what we saw with the Luna, uh, and the V6 version is uh, burning more fuel than the uh, inline-4 versions, which I think makes perfect sense. Uh, as far as a weight distribution, it goes that way as well. And interestingly enough, our uh, Star is actually lighter weight than the Luna is. Which is very interesting. I, that might be uh, partly because of the uh, lighter engine. But even still, that is kind of remarkable considering that this is a more sizable vehicle and that we're actually going underweight. And this, I think, is um, something I've mentioned in the past that I really honestly sometimes baffles me that uh, the actual size of the vehicle and its wheelbase is no indication of the actual end result weight that you're going to get with a vehicle. Uh, and that's something that I would like to change in the future. Uh, but it is what it is for the moment. As far as emissions go, uh, our 2 liter uh, engines are doing pretty good there. Uh, pretty good performers. Uh, definitely better than what we see in the Luna, even though the Luna is not bad. The V6 is uh, not so great, but uh, the 2 liter engine is pretty darn good in this uh, category. Now, as far as the uh, production units here go, it's not far off of the Luna, but we see with the manual transmission versus the manual transmission, there is a slight benefit with the, uh, that, the star, uh, but the automatics are more or less uh, the same. And uh, interestingly enough, the V6 is exactly the same as the uh, inline four here, uh, which is interesting. Now, the premium trim obviously takes the longest time to build. 
and cost goes more or less in the order you would expect it to the manual version being the cheapest then it goes the automatic uh in line for then the uh standard v6 then the premium v6 and the cost is definitely different between the luna and the star uh, we do see a difference here and we also see that with the end cost uh if we go through uh the uh the actual market cost to the, the customer, which we're not being see, we're not seeing here, um, but the actual market cost was also increased over what we saw with the Luna. It's kind of unfortunate that you can't do that direct comparison. The only really way that I know of that you can com uh, compare that is actually going in to uh, the revision here. I mean, I could do that really quickly if you'd like to see the, the base trim of the star versus the base trim of the Luna, just as a quick comparison. Shouldn't take too long to do. We just have to wait for it to load in the numbers. So here we go with 13,471 versus with the uh, Luna. Twelve thousand one hundred and sixty-four. So uh, definitely uh, a difference there in cost that we see pretty clearly, and that's exactly how we want them to go as far as our company goes. And uh, categorization of price order. We don't want the Luna being more expensive. That would be bad. In any case, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This is a Mouse Gunner signing out.